But shockingly, they increased myostatin significantly. Myostatin inhibition for muscle growth may be more significant to some of you than you think and less significant to others. Leo has done a deep dive on some research on myostatin in a rat model using steroids and not using steroids and how this all fits in because we look at the anabolic matrix and we have all these different muscle growth pathways and on it we have the androgen receptor which is steroids and we have myostatin. These are the two we're going to talk about and which one is more important and it's different for different people. And I'll explain why later I prescribe protocols to some people to lower myostatin and I prescribe protocols to other people that don't take into consideration myostatin. So myostatin, we actually want to decrease. Lower myostatin means bigger muscles, more muscles. And that's not the only thing we want to decrease on the pathways. We also have a cortisol pathway. You want to decrease cortisol for more muscle growth. So most of these, we are like increasing these hormones or sensitivity to these hormones, but we have these two pathways, myostatin and cortisol, we want to decrease for maximal muscle growth. All right, so Leo, um, myostatin, uh, what is it and how does it affect muscles? How does it limit its muscle growth? Well, I want, I want to start by saying that this is a very interesting study because it does it is actually um, informative or can change our decision making. I'll, I'll synopsize it at the end. First of all, people have been talking about myostatin for a long time as the secret to unlock your muscle gains. What myostatin does is negatively affect muscle growth. It inhibits satellite cell, what they call myogenesis, the creation of new cells from satellite cells. So satellite cell recruitment, it also inhibits protein synthesis in those satellite cells. Androgen signaling with testosterone, or in this case, what's uh, trialed as trenbolone also, is thought to do the exact opposite. What the authors here wanted to know originally was whether estrogen and dihydrotestosterone, being derivatives of testosterone 5-alpha reductase and from uh, aromatase, whether estrogen and, and uh, DHT had a particular role in affecting myostatin. And it's also unclear how anabolic steroids affected myostatin in the first place. For this reason, they use an aromatizable and 5-alpha uh, reducible hormone, which is testosterone, and they use trenbolone, which can't be turned into estrogen or DHT. Now, they also summarize, you know, the somewhat conflicting literature on myostatin and anabolic steroids. Historically, at least in the fitness community or PED community, we've thought that anabolic and androgenic steroids lower myostatin, and that's one of the ways they increase muscle growth. In this study, what they did is take uh, rats, middle-aged rats, into four groups. They made one a sham group where they do an operation that doesn't do anything. Another, and all the rest were castrated. One group was just castrated, one group was castrated with trend E, trend and athlete, trend balloon and athlete, and one with testosterone and athlete. They were euthanized after 29 days, and they were examined, their muscle mass was examined, their myostatin MR, mRNA expression was uh, examined, and their, most importantly, myostatin protein levels. First of all, I wanted to mention a couple of things. So the, both of these steroids in rodents yielded a similar amount of muscle mass gain, which was massive. But trenbolone had no effect on prostate mass, whereas testosterone increased prostate mass by over 60% compared to the uncastrated rodents. So this is uh, really something interesting that maybe we don't talk about enough in bodybuilding. In fact, so, so if someone wants to do steroids, but they're worried about their prostate, they may have an advantage using trenbolone over testosterone. Imagine, yeah. And we'll talk about this later in another video where we see that, well, we'll talk about it later, about trenbolone having uh, some advantages at lower doses compared to higher doses. So the first thing is the prostate side. And that's why in the paper, by the way, they refer to trenbolone as a SARM. They say it's a SARM-like derivative analog of testosterone. But you know what's weird about that is trenbolone has an anabolic and androgenic ratio of 500 and 500. Mm -hmm. And testosterone has 100 and 100. And usually androgenic means that it's going to impact things like the prostate. It's, it's almost the andro When they say androgenic, they're almost referring direct, directly to. Originally, yeah, the studies, the the studies were like on chicken. Like, um, I don't know if you've seen these studies, like they're called cocks, actually. The chicken that have the, this thing, they would measure like the size of the thing that grows in response. Yeah, that's true. The original studies were like that. But you know, trenbolone has a higher affinity for the androgen receptor than testosterone. But it in, binds harder. Yeah. I don't know if it has more efficacy. But this, but in this study, they they didn't have it. Like it was trend with no estrogen. 
Trend, no, trend, no estrogen. That's the point. In the so absence they, of estrogen. They wanted to see. And Possibly they, trend with estrogen could grow the prostate. I don't know. Potent, but that's, 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 potential. Potential. That's, true. Okay. that's a good point. But so what they found out though in the end is that First of all, DHT and estrogen didn't seem to be particularly powerful for affecting myostatin. Both trenbolone and testosterone seem to affect myostatin the same way. But shockingly, they increased myostatin significantly. Now, originally, the researchers wanted to know, is this increase in myostatin protein expression due to the actual increase in muscle size, which was massive? Because when muscles grow, there are new cells, and those cells have more satellite cells as they're growing. Satellite cells have an unusual concentration of myostatin. So they thought it could be that, but it was not. It's significantly above that. So they concluded one of two things or both of them may be happening. One is that as muscle grows inordinately quickly, maybe the body due to that responds with myostatin. They have to follow this up. But they thought, I think it's more likely that if it is that even, it's also something else, which is they believe that there is some downstream yet not uh, completely clear, although they have some assumptions, downstream gene transcription pathways due to the androgen signaling at the androgen receptor that somehow defeat the responding myostatin downstream pathways that should inhibit this satellite cell recruitment protein synthesis. So what does that really mean? That means that either the bigger you get, or the more steroids you take to get bigger, the more expression of myostatin you have, which is being battled by the androgens themselves, but could mean that you have an even higher potential of unlocking gains than someone else. Maybe not as many gains because they'd be smaller, but uh, like compared to how you're gaining currently. Myostatin may be the, the weakest link of the chain or the, you know what I mean? So this is the scientist talk, but if we look at it from just an overview, evolutionary perspective, myostatin is in place to limit our muscle growth so that our muscles don't get so big that it interferes with our survival. Because, you know, if you look at an MMA fighter, they actually have really great muscle for survival. And they don't have big muscles. They have hard, dense, athletic muscles. Have you seen Vitor Belfort? Well, sure. there's going to be He's some... No, I like outline. I like, I like, I, no, you used to take steroids. I like yeah. the steroid Vito Belt. Anyway, oh, okay. Good, <laughs> but, very good. But, the, but, but for survival, you know, huge muscles uh, isn't, isn't usually the best for survival. It, it's, it's something we do now because, out of, because it's convenient to, we don't have to worry about survival. We do a lot of things. We don't have to worry about survival anymore. But our, but our DNA and, and, our, and our human form has evolved according to what well, helps us survive. Filled with negative feedback mechanisms. There's always feedback. It's a negative That's how the body's so adaptive. Feedback mechanism, yeah. And when, when you have the anabolic matrix here and we have the myostatin pathway, this, this matrix has to be very simplified because if you look at actual muscle growth pathways, You'll see thousands of connections and dots, and it's incredibly complicated, and scientists don't even understand it completely. But when we put myostatin on here, we mean myostatin, and we mean other checks and balances that our biology has to limit muscle growth. And when Leo's talking about downstream effects, we might not even know what they are. He's referring to what I also put under this category of these unknown negative feedback mechanisms when it comes to muscle growth. So now we know, though, that myostatin doesn't necessarily decrease with the use of steroids like we thought before. We thought maybe that was one of its mechanisms of action because going back to Coach Trevor's teachings, that's a kind of a funny way to say it, Coach Trevor's teaching, which may not be scientifically correct, no, but maybe correct keep some mind. of it's bro science, but, but, keep, it, but it works. But keep in mind, like some of them, the studies on that were like, uh, th here they're using supra-physiological amounts of testosterone. It's uh, like around five times the normal levels or something in the body. So some of them were on normal amounts of testosterone. There's different, this might not be the B and end all, but this is we very need, interesting. We need more studies. Yeah, for sure. But this is very interesting. But, but what this could suggest is something similar to what Coach Trevor uh, used to promote in, in our early teachings, which is he would say that steroids lower myostatin, but he would also say that the body adapts. Interesting. And that if you rotate compounds or you increase dosages or you do things to keep the body guessing, you'll have better results for less side effects than if you just stay on a cycle forever because your body will adapt and put negative feedback mechanisms in place, including myostatin and potentially other ones. We so Trevor's theory exist. actually fits the academic's first theory, which is that yes. it develops after. And by the way, the castrated and normal group, they didn't have any myostatin changes, only when you take steroids. So it yeah, could so, be that. So what, so what the real world approach was for us is the bigger someone gets and the higher they get beyond their natural threshold of muscle growth, 
the more they can benefit from myostatin inhibition. So this comes back to when, let's say, you have a client that first comes to you and they want muscle growth. I put them on steroids or SARMs or something like that before I ever worry about myostatin. I worry about myostatin later once they've gotten past a certain level of potential. And once the negative feedback mechanisms start being activated, and then we have to start figuring out how to deactivate the negative feedback mechanisms that are limiting our muscle growth. So that's why... I don't worry about myostatin right away when we're trying to build muscle in the beginning. I worry about it later. The bigger the bodybuilder is, the more we're addressing negative feedback loops and, and therefore myostatin. And mm -hmm. I think that's what the study also the keep study it, Keep also in mind, shows. one month in a rodent's life is like a 24th in our life. So it's like three years or two years. It's, it's so a even, longer time. even though it was cycle. only one month, yeah, it's a long it cycle. was as if a human did a much longer cycle. Long cycle, yeah. It's at least a year long cycle. So. That's why it's not as clear. They need to do a shorter one. Hmm. But the funding for this stuff is very low. That's the, that's the reason I don't really research it. Right. right. All right, friends. Okay. So remember, myostatin is less an important thing when you start growing. Could potentially be the um, elixir of life at the, or of size. At the the holy you, grail. Yeah, when you're using cool. a The hidden steroids of Machu Picchu. And steroids in the long term make you have higher myostatin levels for sure, but we don't know how quickly that happens. And even if that wasn't the case, there's other negative feedback mechanisms in place that we can lump under the general category of myostatin under the anabolic matrix so you understand that the mechanisms do and work. The, and the question then becomes like, everybody knows that if you, I, you know, I stayed on steroids somewhat for like a year and a half once or two years, not on a cruise. So I was <laughs> just doing whatever. At some point, the thing stopped, stopped working. I mean, I was not, I noticed that it was just not, I not only could I, Boston used to say this, God rest his soul, so he couldn't feel stuff anymore. Yeah. The, I always thought it was androgen receptor downregulation, contrary to what Dan Dush, in the old days, they used to think the androgen receptor upregulates. There's some evidence it downregulates. There's some evidence it's completely saturated at low doses. There's a lot of confusing things. But I thought it was the androgen receptor becoming insensitive. It could be a feedback mechanism that's just growing very powerful which I think we've never talked about before also. Yeah, the real world, the real world net effect we, that you just can't debate is that when you hop on steroids, you get a lot better results than you know, a year down the line on the same steroid protocol, right? So there's yeah, no and, question. And just to be clear, this is not a semantic issue. Like the androgen receptor has a response element. So if it's not insensitive, it'll send the response element. If it's insensitive or downregulated, it won't, it'll either catch it and not respond or won't catch it. So if it sends it, but then something else downstream is the one activating it, then we could actually stay on steroids if we could block that thing. So it, it is consequential, yeah? Yeah, Which so, so it's like whether androgen receptors are saturated or whether they've desensitized, like all that doesn't matter if downstream there's something blocking the muscle growth. Yeah, if it, yeah exactly, sort of. Yeah. Be swole and swole, friends of freedom, pioneers of human evolution, a day natty is a day wasted.